even if your haters have a reason, still give God praise. Because even if they haven't cooked it, God has. While you're on your feet, let's pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you, Father God, for your grace and mercy. And we thank you for allowing us to stand behind your sacred desk one more time. Father God, we just ask you for preaching power. And Father God, we ask that you would decrease me and increase in me. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You are my strength and my redeemer. And we pray that somebody hears a word today that makes them better than when they came. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Uh, everybody have Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. If you have it, say, I got it, preacher. I got it, preacher. Let's read, uh, beginning at verse 14, let's read together. The Bible says, And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michelle, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. Amen. Now I'm going to read. You may be seated. I'm going to read to you. Um, there's a bit of sarcasm uh, in this next section of scripture and I want you to notice how uh, this is received. Amen. Verse 20 says, Then David returned to bless his household. And Michelle, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. And David said unto Michelle, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. Verse 22, And I will yet be more vile than thus and will be base in mine own sight. And all of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Amen. That's the word of God for the people of God. You may uh, be seated as you already are in the presence of God. Amen. Today, beloved, I want to talk for just a few minutes as God gives me strength and uh, as I have your attention I want to talk from the thought or theme, the hater in the window. The hater in the window. Beloved, as we live and breathe and serve the Lord, one thing we have to realize and embrace is that in 2019, no matter how good things are going to be, no matter how much better than 2018, 2019 is going to be, there's still going to be storms in your life. Amen. You're still going to have bills. You're still going to have pain. You're still going to have disagreements and disappointments. But that's not something, beloved, that we should be mad about. It's something we should be encouraged because of. The Bible says, consider it not strange the fiery trials that are to test you. But rejoice that you share in the sufferings of Christ. The Bible says, count it all joy when faced with diverse temptations. We're not supposed to be sad about the things we have to go through. Amen. 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 We're supposed to be blessed. Amen. 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 I got a big mouth, so I'll just talk loud. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Did y'all hear me back there? Amen. Amen. I say, count it all joy 
when faced with diverse temptations. Amen. Amen. Uh, we know that uh, as we live our lives, there's going to be some things that we have to go through. Amen. Newsflash, we can never be free of folks who hate on us. No matter how righteous we live, how giving we are, how loving we are, there are going to be folks, from Perkins, who can't deal with the fact that you have favor. There's going to be people who are going to hate you because they ain't you. Look at your neighbor and just say, but God. God. <laughs> but I mean, it's a non-disputable fact that haters going to hate. Yeah. It's their job and they do it well. Yeah. But the good news is, beloved, there's not a hater on this planet that can take away your joy. Yeah. Not a hater on this planet that can take away your peace. Yeah. And God hasn't sanctioned anybody to forfeit your joy and your blessing. Tell somebody that needs to hear this, they can hate me, but I'm still blessed. Amen. Contrary to popular belief, beloved, hate is serve a purpose. And they have a function in our lives. We need haters. You see, haters make us appreciate those who love us. Haters make us stick to our convictions. Haters make us stronger in our walk, and haters make us keep up our prayer life. Haters make us mindful of the need for us to praise. And it's a good thing to continue to live right, continue to live holy, and continue to pray. Because you live these things, you do these things, not just because, but partly because there's a hater who's waiting for you to fail. You see, see, some folks, they live led by an evil spirit. And, they, and the haters want you to fail because the spirit of the Lord lives in you. And because you have joy, because you have peace, because you're humble, because you're happy, and the haters can't stand it because they're miserable. And haters want you to be sad and miserable too because misery loves company. But there's a joy and a peace and a happiness that no hater can destroy. And it comes from the love of God. The love that can do exceeding and abundantly above all that we ask of thing. And this text today and this lesson is going to show us how to deal with your haters. Especially those who hate you while they watch you. Don't say nobody's name, but did, 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 did a certain person come to mind when I said that? Don't say their name out loud, but 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 every, almost every one of you thought about somebody when I said that. Amen. Now, beloved, in the text that we read together, David has done a wonderful thing for Israel. He's brought the of the Ark of the Covenant back to prominence. And can I teach Bible for a minute, Brother Dukes? See, see, the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of God's presence among his people, and it was used to house the Ten Commandments and the tablets that they were on, and it, it was used to house Aaron's rod and manna from heaven. And, and, and the Ark was believed to have power. And when Israel brought the Ark to the battlefield, they were undefeated, they were unbeatable. But as time went on, beloved, some priests took over Israel who were not following God's instructions. They were not being obedient to God's will, and they began to use the ark as a good luck charm. They weren't honoring it, but they were using it for their benefit. Now, beloved, there were specific uh, and detailed instructions for the handling of the ark, and only the priests were to touch it or to carry it. Now, watch this. When Eli, the high priest Eli, and his sons, when they became detached from worship, 
And they were cheating the people and, and they were disgracing the temple with prostitution. And Eli's sons were so far removed from the holiness of the ark and the reverence of the ark and the reverence of the office of, of priesthood that God removed the power that was contained in the ark. And beloved, let me let me let me help you with something. See, you can't use God for your benefit without worshiping and honoring Him. And in their minds, the ark had just become an ornament, only to be used in emer in an emergency. Some folks got crosses around their neck, and when they think that they're in trouble, they they want to pray and hold on to the cross. But the reverence and the respect that was due to art was no longer a priority. And watch this. The men of Israel went out to fight against the Philistines and they were soundly defeated. And the elders thought that it would be a good idea to take the ark out to the battlefield and, and to inspire the troops to victory. They thought that with the ark in the field that they couldn't lose. But when the Philistines saw the ark, they got scared and they fought harder. And they ended up defeating the children of Israel in the battle, cost, ended up costing Israel 3,000 men they lost, including the high priest's two sons. And when the messenger came and gave Eli, the high priest, the news, he said, Eli, your, both of your sons were killed in the battle. And Eli handled that. I'm sure he was upset about it, but then they said, and the Philistines have stolen the Ark of the Covenant. And when Eli heard that, he fell off his chair and broke his neck. And he died. You see, he could better take the loss of his sons than he could take the loss of the presence of God. And even though Eli wasn't acting right, he knew that the ark was holy and that it contained the glory of God. And on his watch, under his leadership, the glory of God had left Israel. And the knowledge that the ark was now in the possession of the enemy was too much for Eli to take. And beloved, uh, that's bad enough, but Eli and his sons, their, their bad behavior had repercussions. Yes, yes. See, watch this. When you're the leader... And you disconnect from God, then your family is going to follow your lead, and they're going to disconnect too. So now these people were without a leader, and they also were without the ark. But watch this: after seven months, the Philistines returned the ark because the presence of the ark had caused all kind of calamity to them. Uh, and the Bible tells they had hemorrhoids and all kinds. They said, we, we got to get rid of this ark. Anybody ever had hemorrhoids? You know. So the Philistines put the ark on the cart and brought it back to Israel. But it was never revered and restored to its holy place of rest. And for 20 years, the Ark of the Covenant rested in obscurity. Now the Bible says that the people were not accustomed to reverencing the Ark while Saul was king. But as we approach our scripture, Saul dies in battle and David becomes king. And he defeats the city. The city was called Jabez, which was strongly fortified. And David changed the city's name from Jabez to Jerusalem. And he called it the city of David. And after this victory, now David is established. The, the uh, Judah and Israel had split. Now David is established now as the king of both Israel and Judah. And the first thing that David does is declare Jew Jerusalem the capital. And he designates a portion of Jerusalem for worship. And he calls that part Zion. So when you hear we're marching to Zion, they're talking about a part of, of the city of Jerusalem. But David has one more enemy to fight, and that's the Philistines. And he fights them, and he defeats them, and he does it twice. Now David has the political power. He has the military might. He is king of Judah and Israel, and he has 
everything under his control now. Israel is becoming the most powerful nation in the world. Then David sends for the ark. Beloved, here's where the problem comes in. If you have a desire to do a good thing, you still have to do it the right way. Can I preach? See, your good intentions don't allow you to break your covenant with God. And if you want God to bless your good deed, then you must heed to God's instruction. David sends for the ark. And either David didn't know the rules for transporting the ark or he ignored them. What David does is, first lady, he gets two men to transport the ark to Zion. But there was a problem, beloved. David used the same method to transport the ark to Zion that the Philistines used to return it to Israel. I got to preach for you right there. See, you can't use the ways of the world to do the work of God. Can I go a little deeper? See, there's a whole lot of churches that's full of people, but when you're inside, you can't tell if you're in the sanctuary or if you're in the club. The music is the same. The people is the same. The dancing is the same. You ought to be able to walk into the church and feel different than you felt before you came in. There ought to be reverence in the church. This is holy and sacred space. Church, there's a right and a wrong way to do God's work. So, so beloved, because of Eli and Phineas and Hophni, they didn't know how to properly reverence the ark. And David had them make a new cart to bring the ark to Zion. It's the same way that the heathen Philistines had brought it from their country. Now, not only did David decide, but David has this big party plan for when the ark comes back to Jerusalem. And, and, and he calls for the men of war and gather in Jerusalem to celebrate the arrival of the ark of God. And everybody is waiting for the ark to arrive. And everybody wants to have the blessing of the ark in the midst of the people again. But during the transportation, the, the ark hit a stone. The cart that the ark was on hit a stone and the ox stumbled. And there was a man named Uzzah. And he put his hand on the ark to keep it from falling off the cart. And God got so angry and he was so tired of their disobedience and so tired of them doing things in a worldly way that he struck Uzzah dead on the spot. And David gets scared and he calls off the party. <laughs> He says, he says, wait a minute, before we bring this ark into Jerusalem, leave it here while I figure this out. And they leave it at a man named Obed-Edom's house. And see, David is angry and scared at the same time because he knew that he was doing a good thing, bringing the ark back. But he couldn't understand why God got so angry that he killed Uzzah. But see, David was following the ways of the Philistines and not the ways that were clearly described in the Torah. You see, the Torah explained that the ark was to be carried by four priests and, and they were not to touch it, but they were to carry it with two long rods and there were rings in the side of the ark and no one was supposed to touch it. They were supposed to stick those rods in and then lift it up by carrying the staves or the rods. So we, we got to give David credit because rather than give up, he searched the scriptures to find the answer. See, I'm here to tell you today, uh, I, I, I want you to, instead of getting mad and giving up, I want you to look at the word and try to figure out how to do the right thing and the right way. Meanwhile, the ark was at Obed-Edom's house for three months and 
And everything and everybody at Obed-Edom's house was blessed. When David got word that, that Obed-Edom was doing so well and his family was do, getting stronger due to the blessing of the ark, David decided to try again. Now, now there's a shout in the lesson. Uh, and the shout is because David failed the first time didn't mean he wasn't supposed to do the good thing that he tried to do. Beloved, sometimes your failures are not because you had a bad idea, but because you didn't do it the way God instructed you to do it. And if you would just take the time to research the scriptures, God will reveal to you what you were supposed to do and the way that you were supposed to do it. So David searched the scriptures and he saw that the ark was to be handled with reverence and care. So David understood where he went wrong and instead of abandoning the good thing that he was supposed to do, he decided to do it right this time. So David selected the four priests to carry the ark and he told the people to be ready in Jerusalem for the celebration of the ark's arrival. Now here's the second shout in the lesson. David not only followed the instruction of the scripture, but look at somebody and just tell them, say he did more. Uh, if you want the blessing that you've been praying for, do more. Uh, Y'all didn't hear me. If you want that thing that you've been praying for, do more. More worship, more praise, more service, more prayer, more meditation, more giving. David did more. More than what was required of God to show humility and service to the Lord. Watch what David does. There's three things David does. How many things? Three. three things David does. One, he tells us in the text. One, he tells the priest, he says, after you go six steps, offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Let me say that again because y'all missed the shout. After you go six steps, offer a sacrifice to the Lord. He says six steps because seven is the number of completion. And see, we want to thank God before we. We want to thank God in the middle of what we're doing. Amen. We want to even thank him in the beginning. We don't want to wait until it's completed. We want to thank God from the beginning and the outset of what we're doing. David said, when you take six steps. Stop right there and give God some praise. Stop right there and give God an offering and a sacrifice. I did it wrong the first time. But I'm going to give God enough praise to make up for what I did wrong. Some say it's way too late to give God the praise. Some saints hold on to their praise until everything is over. That ain't when you praise. That's when you give thanks. You praise while you're going through. Second thing David does is. Bible tells us that. He takes off his kingly robes. He puts on the common garment of a praiser. Sometimes you got to change into your shouting clothes. And, and, and ladies. Sometimes you got to take off those six inch heels. even say put on no other shoes. Sometimes you just got to take them off. So you can go ahead and give God his proper praise because you don't want to be dressed too cool and you don't want to be dressed too fly that you can't give God his praise. If you got high heels, you better have some shopping shoes in your purse. Praise of the righteous ain't supposed to be hindered. And I remember we had a lady at Pilgrim. And when shouting time came, them shoes would get kicked off. Some of y'all worried about looking good. You can look good in hell. I prefer to be barefooted in heaven. <laughs> My 
Bible says a uh, uh, third thing that David does is David danced with all his might. The Bible tells us that he danced out of his garment. Here I'm here to tell you today, beloved, that when the spirit hits your soul and you allow it to have your way, you will shout. And anything that's on you that ain't supposed to be on you is coming off. Uh, he even danced out of his garment, but some church folk need to dance out of their envy and dance out of their jealousy and dance out of their selfishness and dance out of their despair and dance out of their disappointment. You need to dance until whatever is on you that God don't want on you comes off. You better shout about it. David shouted and prayed so hard that he found the joy that he was searching for. David had done a good thing and he had done it the right way. So David had a reason to praise Deacon Daly. But beloved, just as it happens in some churches, not a great harvest. Somebody say, no, not a great harvest. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. <laughs> just as it happens in some churches, while David is praising, there is somebody watching and hating. <laughs> David's wife, Michelle, it's in the window watching David dance. Beloved, don't you hate it when you've got something to celebrate and somebody who's supposed to love you can't share your joy with you? Somebody who's supposed to be in your corner is grinding their teeth because you got blessed. You got a reason to praise and you giving God your best praise. But somebody looking at you saying, oh, it don't take all that. I wish he would stop all that. Beloved, you've got to let your praise find its own end. Beloved, when you get the spirit and you feel like praising, it, it just be polite and give somebody an SOS. You know what an SOS is? Scoot over some. I'm about to get my praise on. Don't you ever let anybody standing on the sidelines affect your praise. And here's why, beloved, if they're not the one who gave you the reason to praise, how are you going to let them stop you from giving God praise? Now, I don't know about you, beloved, but God's been too good to me to sit down on my praise. I'm going to give God the glory and tell the whole world my story. And if you want to sit in the window and hate on me, you better grab some popcorn because I'm not stopping until the spirit says so. Make yourself comfortable because I'm going to be dancing till God says so. If you look at the text, Verse 16 says, she despised him in her heart. Had to read the text several times because I got a problem with verse 15 and verse 16. Because, beloved, how can Michelle be in the house looking out the window when everybody else is in the street dancing and shouting because the glory of God has come back in their midst? And everybody's enjoying the moment except Michelle. Oh, I'm thinking, why don't Michelle just come downstairs and join in the party? Why is she by herself hating on her husband when she could be in the midst of everybody having a good time just like everybody else is? And I was thinking, why? Why did this happen? And God explained it to me. God told me, he said, behind every hater, there's a story. 
I, I told you before, see, some, some haters hate you just because they ain't you. But there are some haters who hate you because they haven't let go of what you did to them. Something you, you might have forgotten, but it's still fresh in their minds. Now watch this. We know from our Bible study that, that, that Michelle didn't always hit David. If we look at first, uh, first Samuel chapter 18, uh, King Saul gives David his daughter Michelle to marry. And the Bible tells us, and this is the specific words of the Bible, the Bible says that Michelle loved David. And when Saul sent men to bring David to him so he could kill David, Michelle saved David. It was Michelle who hid David and allowed him to escape from her father Saul. So, so Michelle didn't always hate David. But watch this. After David escaped, David never came back and got Michelle. I'm telling you behind every hater, there's a story. David never came back to get Michelle, and Saul gave Michelle to another man to be his wife. And the Bible tells us that it was only after David became king that he then asked uh, Michelle's brother, Ishbosheth, if she would bring Michelle to him because Michelle, he considered Michelle his property. He said, I paid for her. You need to bring her back. If you want peace between me and you, you need to bring my wife back. But watch this now. While David was running for his life, he picked up two other wives. And by the time we get to the text where we are in the scripture now, David has six other wives and got kids by all of them. Except for Michelle. I know the ladies know where I'm going. <laughs> Ain't a woman in here going to be all right with their husband having six other wives, kids with all them, and you don't have none? <laughs> Behind every hater, there's a story. <laughs> so Michelle was in the window. And based on this biblical information, she didn't always hate David. I know it's going to get quiet now. But, but beloved, some of your haters got reasons too. And it appears from the text that Michelle was waiting for her opportunity to call David on his mess. So when David came home with the intention of sharing his joy with Michelle and his six other wives, when David had the intention of continuing the praise that he was given in the streets when he wanted to bring the praise home, he was greeted with hate at home. Now I ain't saying it's right, but I understand I'm saying why Michelle might have been hating a little bit. So Michelle comes to tell David how foolish and how common he looked dancing out of his clothes. But there's one more shout. There's third shout, final shout in the lesson. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Even if your haters have a reason, still give God praise. Because even if they haven't forgiven you, God has. And, and I can give you some advice. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Include your haters in your praise. Include your haters in your praise. This is how you do it. I'm giving God the glory even if you don't like me. I'm going to give God the glory. I'm going to praise his name even if you can't stand me. I'm going to give God the praise that he deserves because he deserves it. Not because you like me. Not because you love me.
love me, because you hating on me, that ain't gonna stop me from giving God the glory. David tells Michelle, he said, I was shouting for the Lord. And then, and then David gets a little mean. I got that, that was mean what David said after that. He said, if you think I was foolish then. Some of y'all need to tell your haters, if you think I was praising them then, wait until the next thing God does in my life. Wait until he brings me out from this problem. Wait until he delivers me from my mess. Wait until I get the promotion. Wait until I get the new job. Wait until I get the new car. If you think I was praising them then, you ain't seen nothing yet. You might think I'm crazy, but the only thing crazy about me is I've got some crazy praise to give God. If you have a crazy praise, give God some praise right now, right where you are, for everything that he's done in your life, every blessing that the haters didn't want you to have, every time somebody looked at you and stuck their teeth, every time somebody looked at you and grinded their teeth, just give God a praise in this place, because you didn't have to be where you are. Church open. 